Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Pop Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, I just want to thank you for your ongoing support, because subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, which is already pretty amazing, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, including me. And I guess I'm still trying to figure out whether that's really a benefit. But if you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links that you're going to find in the show notes. Today, I am very honored uh, to be speaking with Krista Song. Hi, Krista. Hello. Krista is, i am just got a whole list of things here. Speech language pathologist, an artist and vocalist, an educator, a community organizer. You were telling me before some political activism. Krista is also the board co-chair for an organization called Chords, and we're going to talk about this. That is the Queer-Oriented Radical Days of Summer, and then also a member of the Transcend Community Chorus that's based in New York City. Holy cats, Krista, do you find, <laughs> how do you find any time to, to do anything else? Honestly, you should see my to-do list and my calendar, and you'd say, <laughs> what are you doing? Take a break, and I agree. <laughs> That's, yeah, I think that's sort of common, I suppose, <laughs> for some of us. But I want to start like way back at the beginning. You, were, you mentioned to me you are also a pianist, although you haven't done a ton of, of playing piano recently. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, I mean, you're now working with chords. You, you are part of a community chorus, transcend community chorus, chorus um, a vocalist yourself, and a speech language pathologist. And that has to have some foundation somewhere. What uh, what originally interested you in the idea of voice and speech? Um, I think I've always thought about language a lot, um, and that naturally means that you think about speech and your voice, which um, produce whatever you're saying. Um, I sure. am multilingual, but um, my first language was Cantonese um, before I learned English. Oh. Yeah, okay. so um, I think even at a young age, I've always thought about how words like kind of formed in my mouth, how they were shaped. Um, I I started piano at a young age, um, so that was like my introduction to music in the beginning. Um, I am the stereotype of playing piano from a young age. Um, I am East Asian. I just realized you, nobody can see me right now. So, <laughs> um, uh, and from there, I started singing along to the piano. Um, and I sure. think that's where I started to kind of think about my voice and how I enjoyed singing, how it felt for me. Um, I studied some voice when I was like a teen um, and like started singing in many different languages. And honestly, whenever I sung in a different language where I didn't know the words, I found myself enjoying singing more because I didn't have to like ascribe necessarily um, value to it or like value to what I was saying. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. Um, and so I think with that in combination with my interest, in, it's interests in language, speech and voice became just a part of, what I was interested in, um, but I actually didn't decide to specialize until I was within the field, I'd say. Um, and nowadays I actually work mostly with uh, s swallowing disorders um, and cognitive oh. communication disorders, um, which I do love, but um, speech and voice has always been another part of this, another part of technically what speech language pathologists do. Um, and I've, you know, had the chance to get back into using my voice in a semi-professional context occasionally. And that's been really fun to do. I would imagine <laughs> that the speech language pathologist, for, um, forgive me, I've, I don't know all the, in, all the intricacies of it. That is mm -hmm. a master's degree, I believe. It right? is a master's degree. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. 
And you were saying before that, that part of your background is in psychology. Yeah. So, so it, when I was an undergraduate, I, my, I had a double major in music and psychology. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, you had mentioned, and, and forgive me if I messed this up. Did you say it was a cognitive, there was a cognitive Cognitive disorder? communication disorder. Okay. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. You were going to leave me hanging. I'm glad you'd leave me hanging for like 20 seconds. But <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Do you want to roll it back? Cognitive? No? Cognitive so, communication disorders. <laughs> is that is that how you you uh, put together both the um, you know both uh, both sides of of your uh, of your undergraduate education? I feel like um, with music and psychology. My those my choices for doing that were or well my dis reasons for hmm. the reason I decided to do a music and psychology double major was because I wanted to keep music part of what I did. Um, sure. But I knew that psychology was something that had more like um, it was interesting to me, right? Because like I like thinking about thinking, I like brains, I liked social psychology a lot uh, when I was mm. studying. Um, I think a lot of those things that I learned in psychology have a lot of application to a number of fields, um, yeah. including like the field of social work, including the field of speech language pathology. It can really uh, like psychology, like if you were to get a clinical degree in psychology, you can work as a psychologist. So that was kind of where I was hoping to go with that degree or, or even what well, I initially was teaching. Um, and that even taught me about group dynamics, how to manage a classroom in a lot of ways. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I, I kind of think of myself as like a person who takes things I learn and applies them to like people I'm working with. Um, so I'm a, an applied scientist, if you will. <laughs> Actually, I quite love that because <laughs> I don't know that there's a lot of value to learning something and then just going, yeah, whatever, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be dogmatic about this. You know, if you can't have some sort of application, particularly, you know, that evolves. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I sort of talked a little bit about <laughs> this earlier, but, you know, and, and maybe we don't need to go back to the political rant that, that uh, we were going we through. Down? But We can record that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I want to. So I had forgotten you had the, that you did a music degree as well. Mm -hmm. um, do, did you specialize in in piano or voice or voice or did you so, special what did you specialize in Sorry. so actually the music degree at my school did not require any specialization um okay. so if i were to kind of talk about what i did while i was in the music program so i went to amherst college um it's mm. a fairly small music program i'd say um and i mean shout out to the amherst college music program woohoo yeah um uh i i i think i did a lot of like learning about music history learned about okay. the basics of like music um composition music theory um but a lot of what i did like was perform in the choirs so i sang in I all of the choirs that i was allowed to based on my gender presentation um but oh. now what's nice is that they no longer require you to be of a specific gender i believe they just call it really um, club chorus and choir for the glee the former glee club women's chorus and concert choir i see yeah that's kind of neat <laughs> it is neat and um yeah and and has played into I mean what you're doing now with with the Transcend Community Chorus as well. Yeah, for sure. And do, I, you, I've been do you like mind just to throw a little bit about about that because I was looking at the the website and it looks I mean fascinating. Just yeah, I'm gonna stop talking. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Transcend Community Chorus is a chorus that I joined actually when I moved back to New York a few years ago. Um, and at that time it was like a, a 10 person choir, um, led by a Dr. Felix Graham. Um, he has created this space for, uh, trans and gender nonconforming singers. Um, it is an open space to all gender nonconforming voices. So you don't even necessarily need to be, um, of transgender identity to join. 
Um, yeah. But anywhere yeah. where you yeah. feel like your voice has been, or anybody who feels like their voice has been excluded in some way. I see. Um, and it's it's grown in size, so now it's about a, I think, I want to say 20 to 25 person oh, choir. Shoot. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's bigger now, and we have a lot of voices, a lot of people who have returned because they love the space and they love the community that we are. Um, yeah, I, I'm also on like one of the organizing committees, like the member organizing, uh, it's actually the transcend member elective committee. So you can elect to help kind of plan out social events or plan out like, um, meetings for us to help guide how we want uh, the community chorus to look like for us and how it can better support us, how we we can access it better and more easily. I think that's awesome. I appreciate the idea of that. She said somebody, I like the way you put it. I mean, it is a, it is a community chorus Mm -hmm. and you said it's for anybody who feels they don't, that they don't have a voice. I think it's how Mm -hmm. you put, that was a great quote, how you you said, because it's a chorus that you go and join because you feel that you don't have a voice. I, I, or you feel like you don't fit into traditional choir. Like if you yeah. have a voice that doesn't necessarily conform to the expectations of what that SATV oh, kind of format yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. it's really hard because then like your voice isn't necessarily supported by the director because it, it doesn't sit the way that it, and I put this in quotation marks, should, the way that the it, way it should. should. Yeah. Right. Right. God, that's beautiful because it kind of lead, led into a question that I had written down, but I wasn't sure how we'd back into it. Because <laughs> anybody, anybody I've met who has a music background, because I didn't learn music theory until literally, I don't know. It's fake. Four, four years ago? or <laughs> It's what? It's fake. <laughs> Well, now I'll tell. See, the thing is that, like, you know, for the I would see chords and say it was like such and to be diminished or something. I'd be like, that's not even real. Like, what the hell is that so, supposed to mean? That's not it even means real. That what? some cis white guy wrote it down on a sheet at some point and was just like, that's what this chord is. And you're like, but why? <laughs> like, why can't it just be? But I, no, I mean it's a good, joking. it's a great question. The yeah. thing is, like, so I'll tell you when I learned when I learned any music theory at all, because I'm nowhere near an expert. Okay? <laughs> like, I was surprised I pulled out a diminished whatever, but pretty good. Um, but when I was sudden, when when I, I have always sat down and written to to write a song. Always, like I've done a ton of them. Um, but when I have written a song, I've always thought, well, how the hell do you even figure out? Would you use a seventh here? Do you use a minor? What do you use here? Why would it sound good? And I never knew what to try. And then I learned some, di- you know, the diatonic chords in a mm-hmm. in a in a scale. And I went, oh, mm-hmm. that's really not that hard. And then I felt mm-hmm. like an idiot because <laughs> I do that a lot in my life. But my question was going to be, boy, it was a long long walk just to get to one crummy question. <laughs> you you talked about you know things the chorus the way it should be. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, there's, there's much more interest in, 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 inclus, in inclusivity, I think I want to use, I want to call it, than doing it as it should. So how do you balance that? I mean, with a background both in, uh, with a background in music, but also with the psychology, is, is that some of the way that you balance that art, the artistic with, you know, the dry, cis hat, <laughs> white guy technical stuff? I think I'm going to need you to ask that question again because I didn't understand. I know. But it was like 18. It took like 20 minutes just to get the one question out. Hit me with it I'm, again. And this time I'm really listening. I'm still I'm still honing my craft. That's what it is. You know. That's wonderful. No, I love kidding. that. I so, love that. <laughs> no, I have no problem. So I guess the question is just you you have this technical background, but you, you mentioned the, the importance of... of the art, you know, if you don't fit into the SATB, what do you do? You know, mm. so do you want to, you know what? I forget what all the SATs was. Soprano, alto, tenor, tenor bass. And, bass. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say baritone, but that's I mean, not the same, right? That is a thing though. So if you split it out, it's actually, if you split it out into three parts per each 
gender. Oh, it's soprano, okay. mezzo soprano, alto, then tenor, baritone, bass. Um, okay. So upper voices, lower voices. In our choir, we tend to just phrase it as that, and we number the parts one, two, three, four. One mm -hmm. being the highest voice, and four being the lowest voice. Okay. I forgive. This is going to be a dumb question because I just, but I got to know. I mean, uh -huh. there are men who can do soprano. Vo I mean, uh, yeah. let me rephrase that. Sorry. I'm freaking transgender and I'm putzing this up. There are it's people hard. assigned male at birth. No, I know. Yeah. Assigned male at birth who can do like a soprano voice. Mm -hmm. And then there are, there are people assigned female at first. At <laughs> Good God. <laughs> assigned female at birth who can do uh -huh. like a bass voice. Like were those voices in, in SATB, were they necessarily separated by gender? In our choir or in, uh, uh, I guess or in like general yeah. classical choir. Okay, yeah. yeah. Good question. It really depends on like what kind of choir it is because um, really? little like amabs, <laughs> like children, amab children. Let's say yes, right. they they do. They can have this higher voice. Um, they would be called like a boy soprano or or any number of oh. different things. Um, but they, I think they are like more traditionally used in. I don't want to, actually, I'm not going to say that because I can't really support that. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but I would say that they were like, they sang like solo parts in like church music. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that they were mixed into general choirs. Um, and then people who had lower voices who were AFAB, like they would sing these parts that you would call traditionally like a contra tenor part. Okay. Um, and hold on, let me just make sure I'm not actually saying the wrong thing because there's counter tenors and there's con contraltos. Um, I can rescind the question too. I mean, no, no, no. Okay. So a <laughs> counter tenor is a male singer who can sing as high as a soprano or a mezzo soprano range. Oh, okay. Okay. Male singer is what Google yeah. says. Yeah, Thank assigned Google. male at birth. Assigned male right. at birth. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Google. Um, thanks, Google. Thank you for taking all of my information and knowing exactly what I need. Um, and a contralto is somebody who is an AFAB <laughs> singer who can sing as low as a tenor range. Oh my uh, gosh, okay. Mm hmm. So it's. These, these terms have been used to, like, describe certain kinds of voices. So there have yeah. has been language to describe this diversity in voice since, um, I mean, or westernized, I should say. In westernized music, they have these words already. Right. Um, right. And I think talking about ranges and talking about, like, where your voice sits, like, that certainly kind of gets into um, talking about, like, pitches and talking about, um, Hertz ranges, uh, you can get really quickly into this idea that high and low is a binary, um, and right. there's really just so much in between. Yeah. And so I guess, I don't know why I'm pounding on this because I'm just, uh -huh. I, mean, I don't, I know very little about like classical choir. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I mean, I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's still on my shelf there. I haven't read it. I mean, That's I got like a lot of books. Me and all my books on my shelf currently. They're all on my to read yeah. list right now. Right. So, so I've got a book actually about. Is I don't. What's the right word for it? Is it choir, chorale, chorus? Yes. Or all the all the all the same. Okay. Well, I mean, they probably need different about things, it. but. <laughs> okay, but you know what? Don't pull up Google again because Google's going to give us some you know gender binary clap trap. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I don't want to engage with it. Screw you, Google. That's right. Stop taking all my information, Google. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It probably knows where you are right now. Google's tracking you. It definitely does. I think my phone like has like the find my phone function or whatever on it right now. Oh, so it does. It yeah, does. I know. No, they're they're watching you. They're watching you. They're That's listening. a window behind you, isn't it? Because they're there's a window right over sure there. Sure you don't want yeah, you sure you don't want to close that curtain? I don't It's like uh one of those drawstringy <laughs> things that I gotta like go over there and pull, so no, I'm not doing <laughs> Oh well, then never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Let's go back to the thing then. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to play too much more into your um, 
uh, your paranoia. <laughs> so, <clears throat> just because you're paranoid, though, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not out to get you. Wow. And I just want to. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to say that it's, yeah. in, it's important, just yeah. important. So that's true. Right now, everybody in the audience is going, God, are they going to move on? Because what the <laughs> hell? We've just been stuck. <laughs> We're just chatting. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so you would actually mention, so part of, um, part of what you, you were doing or still do, I guess, with Transcend Community Chorus mm -hmm. is you had mentioned that there was some, some community outreach and some, uh, mm -hmm. um, in general, community stuff. Mm -hmm. And much of the reason you and I were connected... Oh, I even forgot to mention that. Because I, I always love to mention Kevin Dorman. Yes, who, I love who Kevin. I, yeah. <laughs> and it was Kevin who, um, who connected us. Yeah. In part because I had asked them about... Well, com community people. You know, people who, who are more uh, involved in, in bringing mm -hmm. together community as well, you know, in terms of, uh, of voice and, and like, you know, well, you know, SLP type stuff, speech language pathologist <laughs> type stuff. So yeah. community, you were the, the board co-chair, first of all, for courts, and then also, um, community with transcend. Um, and now I got to imagine like community has also always been important in your life. hundred percent. What spawned that? I honestly think that it comes from my own upbringing. Um, I was not necessarily raised just by a nuclear family, this ideal mm -hmm. that's, you know, very Western, very American. Um, yes. I was raised by what we call a village, right? Like uh, I was raised by my parents, plus my grandparents, plus um, all of my mom's friends um, and her, like her friends' relatives. Like I have... Um, memories of you know going and like being watched by my aunt's father um and like my auntie you know how um yeah aunties aren't necessarily related by blood i had yes. i had so many aunties growing up um so that to me really highlighted how important it is to have a community um and how important it is to have people who will support you um and i've thought about this recently in like the context of child rearing like it's impossible to raise an entire human, um, with just two people. It's just not possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so I, I feel like with that kind of perspective and plus just like always valuing community, always finding ways that I've always wanted to connect with people. Like I've always wanted connection. I've always really valued it. And I also derive a lot of healing, uh, from my communities as well. Sure. Um, and I think in the broader context and this is going to get political again, but the broader context of like late stage capitalism and the fact that we are currently dying, um, under the American empire for me, at least, <laughs> um, I think, with all of that in context, like who can we look to for support? We're not necessarily going to be able to find it from the government just based on how things have gone. So who can we right. depend on but our community? You know, I, I'm going to admit to a, almost like a sense of jealousy as you were telling me. <laughs> Because I grew up, I mean, as, as you were telling me about your childhood, you said, you know, you had all of this community around you. And mm -hmm. I had a very opposite kind of experience so much of my, you know, my my parents were were very god insular is that the word i don't know but i didn't have a lot of community around me and like my father's family was states away and my mother's mm. family was estranged and and uh mm -hmm. you 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 know you said yo you it takes more you know more than more than um two people to you know to create a a, a a healthy human. I, I forget how you said that. I, I don't know if it was to healthy, raise a whole human, a whole, a whole, whole, a whole ass human. human. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Because you don't want just a half ass. No. <laughs> if you're gonna have an ass, get a whole ass human. Get a whole ass human. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't get that experience, and yeah. I, you know, I look now. So my point was going to be because your experience was you had a lot of community, and you said, "Boy, this is great," and I mm -hmm. felt like I had very little, and now. 
I mean, honestly, it's only been a couple of years that I'm sort of like, gosh, there are a lot of people out here. Yeah. A lot of people who can support me or whom I can support or, and I guess, you know, cause I had written down this question and I'm looking at this going, Ooh, wow. That said a whole lot about me is community <laughs> critical for a healthy childhood. I, I read it back and I went, Oh shit. That really. <laughs> Oof. I'm going to bring that one to my therapist later. <laughs> I, know. I know. The thing is, I just, I just dropped it out there. And as you were talking, I looked at it and went, <sighs> well, that hit me. <laughs> Going to need I mean, a lot more therapists. Yeah. So. And I mean, I, I definitely believe that a community is critical for a healthy childhood. And I think that's kind of yeah. shown in the fact that a lot of queer kids, like they're not just seeking like adult community. They're seeking community from each other. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so like Chords is a place where they can find that queer community and build it and, and start building it now. Because what is a queer community but feeling different and feeling maybe that your community that you have necessarily like with your family, like that's not that's not the only community you have. That's not the only family you have. Right. Um, right. And so if we can give these youth a place um, and an opportunity to build that community and build not just community amongst themselves, but see queer adults and see that they have a future um, and see that they are part of a larger community and we're doing this for them. And when they get to our place, they might also want to do exactly what we're doing and give that community back to the youth, yeah. um, to queer youth. Yeah. I, I want to throw like a counterpoint because, Ooh, okay. and this is not just to be, you know, contentious, but this, er, early on, I mean, maybe it's a little bit, but early on in, in when I started thinking about, um, you know, the work that I, the work that I've done anyway, mm-hmm. early on, I, I, cause I would meet people, especially in the transgender community. And this is not to diminish any of the people that I'm going to dis- describe here, I felt that when I when I met people, <laughs> you're already smiling. You're like, no, that's going to it's going to. No, I'm some. interested. In, I'm so interested <laughs> to hear what this question is now. So, well, when I so there were some people I met and I said, well, you know, tell me about yourself. And they listed like four or five words like I can remember, you know, well, I'm like, I'm going to struggle here. I am. I am a demisexual, sapphic. Uh, a row, a set. I mean, it was a, it was a, like a long laundry list of here are all the the labels that I have adopted. Hell um, yeah! And again, I I don't <laughs> want to diminish, you know, the the because there's sort of a shortcut way. I mean, it's a good. It can be a good shortcut to say, well, this is in general who I am. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I guess I wonder as we establish community. How much do we integrate and how much do we segregate ourselves by using some of these words? I mean, because community, you originally said family, and now we're talking about the LGB, the queer community. Yeah. Why are the two different, I guess? How are they different or where are the two different? uh, Mm -hmm. Why do you, why are they different? Why, why do they have to be different? They aren't. That's definitely what I'm saying. Like, I'm saying that, like, Good. queer family <laughs> is queer community. Like, we, you know, when you hear, I actually wrote this in a in an Instagram caption once, and my mother became very upset at me. But I, I called my friends my chosen family. Um, yeah. And my mom was just like, what does this mean? <laughs> English is not her first language. She doesn't necessarily understand what the context of that was. And I had to explain to her, I was just like, these are my friends. These are the people that I choose to also have as my family. Like family is additive. Relationships are additive. I think that being in the queer community and I'm so fortunate, I should like really be highlighting how fortunate I am to have like a relationship with my family. Um, I used to, really dislike having relationships. So sorry, mom and dad. I love you very much. Um, but I used to like they, really struggle they with that relationship. They aren't listening. <laughs> They're not listening. Dude's cool. You can dump on anybody here. Cause no, <laughs> um, our relationship was like, not necessarily like I always felt obligated to them in a way that wasn't positive. Sure. But as yeah. I got older, I like realized how much that obligation 
kind of goes back to this idea of like when you give something, you give something back. Um, the idea of gift economies. Um, if you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, I truly recommend it. Um, it's no. a very good book. Um, it's I can't remember the name of the author right now, uh, but Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, it's kind of about indigenous knowledge um, and about the ways that we should kind of be reframing our relationship to the world um, and particularly the earth. Um, yeah. So it kind of goes back to thinking, I forgot, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, I mean, I it was, it was cho chosen family, chosen yeah. family versus, you know, inherited family yes and and like you have no obligation necessarily to your inherited family if they hurt you or if they mm -hmm. um break your boundaries like you have no obligation to somebody that you're related to by blood sure. just because they birthed you and just because they closed you and all those things you are not beholden to them that was their responsibility to you um they didn't owe you you don't owe them anything just I yeah. totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find many parents do not, but <laughs> it, it's be, true. I, I think it's big. I'm trying to figure out how I want to put this. It's like, it, there's sort of a transactional. Yeah. And <laughs> there is an inherent adultism to raising children. There is this idea that your children belong to you. Um, oh, yeah. And that is, never the case your children grow up to be their own people and their own beings with their own opinions um and yeah parents might not like that but that is how it is um and it really is up to parents to make sure that you maintain a positive relationship with your child they they want to be there i, I don't think there's any child who wants their parents to not love them i think no that's all they want like that's in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm yeah. speaking very generally here, obviously, and I probably shouldn't <laughs> because everybody, no. every family's different. Everybody is different. True. Yeah. True. But I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that, that there was a line, I'm, I can't even believe I'm going to bring this up, but <laughs> do you remember that, that movie with Brandon Lee, the crow? Do you remember that one? No, I don't okay. know if I've seen that. All right. It's, it was Brandon Lee, and it came, would have come out early 1990s, probably 93, 94, because I know I saw it. I would have been two when it came out. I was in graduate school. I'm Thank so you, sorry. Krista. I'm for a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I always appreciate those sort of those sort of things. So when somebody goes, "Oh my God, I wasn't even born," and I'm like, <laughs> "Thank you <laughs> for making me feel like an old lady." I appreciate. it. Just but, you have more wisdom is all. Tell me. <laughs> I I I. Uh, all right. So anyway, in the movie, <laughs> you're killing me. <laughs> in the movie. I'm going to try to get past this as quickly as possible. There's, there's, <laughs> there's one line, and I'm probably going to murder it because it wasn't actually in the in the the graphic novel or you know the comic books by James O'Barr. Anyway, in it, um, the the line goes. Um, I believe it was "Mother is the word for God in the lips and hearts of all children," and um, I remember. I, my mother is not listening to this. I can virtually guarantee it. But um, she, you know, I remember hearing that and I thought, you know, that's so true. We want our parents to love us, to care for us. And I don't want to go all modeling on us on, on the whole thing. I mean, I tend to do it anyway. But like one of the things that I wrote about recently was how my community seemed so not supportive and, and how it's, it's affected me now, you know, into my fifties. And, and it's, uh, you know, I think, I think your point that the children want their parents to care about them. Yeah. I think it's completely true. You know, there, I don't think there's anything worse than having a parent reject you because I at least assume parents want to care about their kids. Otherwise, why'd you have kids? You know, <sighs> There are lots and lots of bad reasons to have children. 
Yeah. Period. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was kind of going to follow up and then I went, mm, No, yeah, there's nothing not. else to say. <laughs> it's like, yeah. there are definitely bad reasons to have children. Um, right. And plenty of good right. reasons to have children too, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. To... To pull this around a little bit, because I realized now we really did go into the <laughs> people will be skipping forward. There's because the reason I brought up the labels at the beginning, I've heard uh, people in the queer community say, "Look, I kind of want to stay aloof. I kind of want to be separate. You know, I don't. I don't want to be part of. of I'm going to put this in quotes. Nobody can see my air quotes, but I, yeah, I don't want to be part of normal community." Do you, with your focus on community, what do you think about that? Do, do you get that do at you, all? Is there? No, I ahead. don't feel like that's, that's true at all. I think that I have like heard this idea that like excluding straight people from queer spaces, like that that's kind one. of thing. That's what you mean? Like, yeah. okay. So, um, no, I, no. I can give you another example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is one. The, there is because a lot of the work that I've done that I've when I've written about gender is I is I've I've written that it is a universal human process, mm -hmm. and I've and I've never had more vociferous uh, <laughs> opposition. There we go. Mm -hmm. Everything okay over there? <laughs> never didn't get any more vociferous opposition than from the transgender community who are like no 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 gender is mine. Gender is not, does not belong to Ron DeSantis. Gender belongs to me. And don't take it away from me. I would argue that cis people, like, cis people, they care a lot about gender. They do. They care Otherwise, they wouldn't so care about much about me. gender. They have uh, gender reveals. Like, there's so much that cis people do that tells them how not okay they are about gender. Um, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So I, I think that gender is everybody's. I think that everybody has one if they want one too, because some people are also agender and do not have gender. Um, I think that there is some amount of outgroupness that straight people do feel in queer spaces because mm -hmm. what their modus operandi isn't like, normative there um right and i think there is an importance to having queer spaces and like queer and trans only spaces um i think they are places for us to find community um and build um within that community um just as they're the it's very important to have spaces that are exclusively for people of color um it's where a lot of multi excuse me multiracial organizing happens and even within multiracial groups there should be a space for people who have more specific identities because people of color is not an identity being black is an identity being east asian is an identity in a lot of ways so those those groups should also have a space to to find community and organize together. Um, there's always a place for solidarity, too. Um, there are spaces for that. Um, there are spaces that are also um, not like um, explicitly like straight passing only, but that is much of spaces, I'd say, um, so I, I, I can't go to the supermarket. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, go to the supermarket. You should, you're supposed to pass your else. You will be stared at. And if you wear clothes right. where, um, you have, like, if you wear clothes that are not of your gender or like, um, uh, I'm trying to think if like, an, like if you wear a dress, people will like try and look at your body and check to make sure you have the right parts for it. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not great. Um, I don't really get it, but I do. I know why, but I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we hit upon the. I think we, I think we exhausted <laughs> them because it's kind of we got to the point where it's like, eh, 
What are you going to do? I, and, <laughs> I mean, and I'm not diminishing that. It's, there's, yeah, there's so many spaces that, that, like I go, that if I didn't, um, mm-hmm. if I didn't pass as exceptionally as I do, and go ahead and you can tell, you messed up with the age thing, so help me out with the passing. Girl, you look so good. Right? You look so, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have you, we're going to pay you to follow me around. <laughs> oh, girl, look at you with your hair flip. Mm, yes, love that. <laughs> awesome. God, what the hell was that? Oh, wait, we, okay, we, over, we overused that one. Okay. My gosh. Shameless plug. Uh-huh. Um, so let, let's move. So it's not really, you know, what are you going to do? But, you know, yeah, I, it's... I, I, I'm not sure how you solve that. And I wish we could because there's so much where it's like, hey, wait a minute, you're wearing a dress. I mean, even like there, you know, there are women who who don't have, say, had had uh, you know bilateral mastectomies, mm-hmm. go to the market in a dress, and people go, oh, what's wrong with her? You know, I mean, yeah. and and, really? and this is... and the fact of the matter is that like gender presentation and like gender diversity absolutely has an impact on cis people too like oh my gosh yes they don't they don't okay i shouldn't say they um i don't understand how it's possible for them to look at somebody and say like that person is not femme enough when they're completely cis or like to judge cis people as like femininity is being able to carry a child and having a uterus and all this kind of thing and i'm just like you're excluding cis people when you say that like you, well yeah yeah. So, but, but those those <laughs> those movements are not about inclusivity. I mean, they just because maybe we can just you know leave it at that. Just no, we we only want a certain group of people in our world. The mm-hmm. rest of you can get in a rocket. Maybe Elon Musk will send you off to Mars in his little Tesla. You know, and you can sit there with a <laughs> stupid driver's wheel and all that. So I like to smack that guy in the back of the head. <laughs> I almost hit myself. Did you see that? That would have been a good. I would what not a edit that effect. out. Was... Yeah, good sound effect. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great? <laughs> <laughs> that was my cheat, folks. You had no idea. <clears throat> Who had any idea? So they're not looking. Anyway, these people are not looking to 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 have a, a a single humanity they're looking to have a single homogeneous humanity that passes you know their tests not you know all right now we now we really did because i want to talk about chords we were going to talk the, <laughs> half the reason we were going to talk was we're 45 minutes in I and know. i only just got to it i'm sorry <laughs> that's that's all on it's me. not on you <laughs> it is because i end up going off on these tangents and then the you know the guest is like oh I'm similarly undisciplined in topic maintenance, so don't worry. <laughs> wow, I really can I borrow that undisciplined in topic maintenance is phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cats. I'm using that. Um, all right, courts. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So this is the queer oriented radical days of summer. And I see on the website, which by the way, there'll be a there's a link right there will be links to both to courts and transcend in the um in the show notes oh and incidentally i took a note on braiding sweetgrass i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna stick that into the show notes i meant to tell you that and i didn't but please do yeah so courts is targeted towards southern youth i noticed Mm -hmm. i actually i went to graduate school in in northeast georgia and it was and at the time so i was 20 whatever I was 20-something. You were two. I just wanted to point that out again, <laughs> I was folks. A <laughs> <laughs> but it was – what was interesting was that when I got to graduate school, I actually really leaned into being both pansexual and transgender. I didn't really – I didn't have either of those words because those are, those are kind of newer words. Yeah. But I really leaned into that in, you know, the, the early, to, early to late 90s when I was in Georgia – and I, it was funny because I thought it was okay. Like, it seemed like the the acceptance was not bad. I mean, people were kind of like, "Wow, that's a that's a strange person. What the hell?" <laughs> but then, but I, it was kind of like, "Well, I don't know." Oh, I heard she's from California, and everybody would go, "Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my totally get it." So, and by the way, may I may I point out, you look great in that skirt, you know. 
that there's from California and you look great in that skirt too. That's cool. Don't worry. Um, so there's, there's a reason why you want to target this towards Southern youth. What so, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think the, actually, funnily enough, the way that I was first introduced to this camp was through Kevin Dorman. Um, oh, cool. so Kevin Dorman used to be on the board of courts as well. Um, and I joined oh. initially as a volunteer, but stayed on because I realized that camp is magic. Um, and so Kevin is based in North Carolina and the camp is based mm -hmm. in North Carolina. Right, um, right. so it has also been a learning experience for me having never lived in the South. Um, I've only really scraped the surface. I don't have the knowledge of uh, be living in the South. Um, okay. so, but I have appreciated the learning that I've gotten and I've also come to really value the space, um, as a Southern youth facing space. Um, I would say that youth in the South are facing some of the most, um, stringent, uh, anti-transgender laws. Um, there's been a lot of movement in local legislature to, um, basically erase their existence, erase the existence of gender diversity. Um, and actually I think recently one of my board members was telling me about, um, uh, working at UT Austin and the fact that all of their things that are around diversity, equity, and inclusion have disappeared uh, based on a recent state law that was passed. Really? And now things wow. like the Women and Gender Center, I think, have had to shut down or rename themselves um, in order to uh, keep operating or like shut down certain portions yeah. of uh, their operating because they were too DEI focused. Um, so I, and this is a UT Austin, you mm -hmm, said? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh my yes. gosh. Yeah. I mean, one of the flagship universities in Texas and they're, yeah. I admit yeah. I'm, I'm, so I'm speechless. It doesn't happen often, Krista, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, really? Yes, wow. really. Yeah. And I should, I can like reach out to my co-board member and ask her about it for more specifics if even, you'd like it for the show notes, yeah. but it's wild. It is completely yeah. wild the way that things are changing. And so frequently the rhetoric, um, when it comes to, you know, queer organizing and organizing in the United States specifically, it's very almost hostile towards the South because their sure. votes, their presidential votes all go to the red, the red candidate, red right? Red. Grr, yep. red team, blue team. Like that is the extent of what most people think of when it comes to politics. Um, and yeah. they don't think about the lived experience, the people who live there, the significant black community that lives in the South, oh, um, yeah. the significant cultural like touchstone of being Southern and black. Like these are all different things that you are saying aren't worth trying for when you say that there's nothing in the South for queer kids or queer people, like just yeah. leave, just move. It's not right. We like youth do not have the choice to move. Many people, adults, Southern adults, queer adults, Southern queer adults do not have the choice to pick up and move. Um, True. Poverty is a thing. Um, being able to like mobility is a thing. Disability is a thing. All of these things right. mean that we should be investing time and, and effort into organizing in the South. That's an amazing point. And I will tell you, I think I was in the former category that mm -hmm. the, there's no use even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But, but that, but that was a conversion moment right there. That was truly amazing. I just want to point that out. I mean, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, that's a depressing, <laughs> those are depressing things that you mentioned. So, yeah. so tell me about, tell me about the magic that occurs at these, sorry, I use magic a lot, I but I mean, no, I agree what with sort of, <laughs> yeah, what transformations, what lights, what, uh, what happens at these camps? I'll be honest, I've never been in person to one of these camps because the year that I started volunteering, we went virtual. Um, okay. But I've had personal experience being at camp and knowing the 
wild transition as a youth it was for me from being a, like a person who ostensibly like was under the thumb of my parents or whatever, but then like coming yeah. to a place where there were other people like me. And for me, it was yeah. nerds, by the way. I went to uh, a nerd camp where we literally took like courses um, during the day and like with other people, like other kids who were smart and tested and passed a certain test. Um, it was amazing. It was so fun for me. <laughs> um, but I think that's essentially what the camp is for our campers too, because the year that I was virtual, we were still able to create this community. Um, this was 2020 when we we're all looking for that connection um, among the campers. Um, that looks like them discovering something new about themselves because somebody yeah. shared about their identity with them. It's being able to put together something that's incredible. So um, in at Chords, the campers are put into bands um, and the bands co-write and then perform the song at the end of camp at their showcase. Cool. Yeah. It's this experience where they basically have to contend with each other as bandmates and understand each other. They have to make art together. Um, and the other portions of it, we also have workshops throughout the time that they're there about different topics that aren't, don't necessarily even need to be music related. Um, some topics include things like queer history, things like a oh. drag night, um, yeah. things like, uh, queer science even um i'm trying to think of some of the other ones sometimes this year we've had like volunteers think about things like um a foraging activity um in nature things like um ask an elder where they just go around and ask all of the queer counselors like tell me about this specific thing um about yourself and they love it um so being able to interact with queer elders um and also mm -hmm. being able to create that community amongst um youth that are their age that have that see them that understand them that let them craft their identity um at camp we have them make name tags new name tags every day um and name new pronouns every day so if you want to go through camp playing with your pronouns playing with your name and playing with your identity yeah. You're allowed to. Um, you can decide that your pronouns today are he, she. Great. Maybe next day your pronouns are z, z -er. Um, Great. We're so excited that you're playing, um, that they get the opportunity to be in that space where um, other kids understand them, have gone through something similar even, or just they understand what it's like to, to be othered in some ways and right. to not necessarily fit in. Right. I got to figure, I mean, there are two things that I would think. First of all, I got to imagine these are, these are experiences that, that help, help these kids feel that they're living. I don't know yeah. a better way to say that. Like, this has got to be just like a spark that, that gives them the reason to keep going until next year. I mean, so, so first yeah. of all, good on you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, cause this kind of <laughs> stuff, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't exist when I was a kid and I was in Southern Me California, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, the other thing that I would imagine, I would imagine that the, the parents of these children are probably pretty accepting. Uh, yes, they, they have to be in order to come to camp because they have to have to, parent consent to come. Yes. Yeah. And we, is there, we, mm -hmm. no, go was, ahead. You're probably going to go where I was going to go. So I was just going to say, we, as a camp have been thinking about that, how we should also be supporting their parents. Um, and maybe parents that aren't accepting, but wanting to understand their children more. Um, unfortunately we can't work with kids whose parents don't consent. So we have to get to a point yeah. where a parent is, asking questions and a parent is trying to understand right. their kid. Yeah. Yeah. How, do you know how far around, uh, children have come to, to be, I mean, you said you went virtual, but before, do you know how far people would travel? I think 
I can't remember the specifics, but I do remember people like going on multi-day road trips in order to be oh, around for camp. Yeah. Wow. Um, people driving from like, but like there are families who do that during the summer. Like they will drive across the country with their, their kids and they'll go True. to a camp one week and like the parents will do something else that week and they'll come back, pick up their kids. So yeah, I, I think there are a few families that like that, that, Thinking like two or yeah. three campers like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I don't know the extent. I do know that we had some people from California join us. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, people fly in. Um, and I mean, this year we are going to be back to in person, which I'm so, so excited about. But Oh, that is great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're we're going to be in person this year. And so, like we said, uh, like I said, we've been... Um, interviewing volunteers um and we're going to be starting to open up camper applications starting april 1st um, oh gosh yeah i know very soon. very soon and we have anxious parents just like they cannot wait to get in and i'm like so excited that they're excited i'm like hopeful though that we're gonna get a big diversity in terms of campers and in terms of age in terms of like what states they're from um, but generally yeah. we are trying to target southern youth so we put most of our promotional energy and like more more of our like rollout towards um, parents in the south if possible sure yeah. sure and and I, I don't know if I even mentioned because it's it's 12 to 17 mm-hmm. uh, children yes. 12 uh, Children age 12 to 17. It's hard for me to say children when you're like 17. Yeah, I know. I usually say kids like a, or youth, but youth is yeah, hard y- to say youth, too. That sounds <laughs> kind of is. <laughs> but th- this sounds like amazing, just amazing work. I'm, I'm curious how it could expand to parents who would not be very, who would not normally be very accepting of this yeah. and you know if, if they could see if they could see the juxtaposition of their 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 youth there we go mm-hmm. their youth at home you know looking drab and dead and then you put them among people who accept you know whatever it is their queerness and see them mm-hmm. spark into life i wonder if parents would go oh dang well i now i know thank you krista for teaching me you know <laughs> I mean, who my my child is. I mean, I'm sure that parents are excited by the changes that they see and they, they are invited to the showcase at the end. Mm. So they get to see the, the work that their, their kid put into, um, whatever art that we created together at camp. Um, so that's, that's the goal. We do want parents to realize how important queer identity is to them, but, uh, I think part of our ideas, we're, we're very small right now during the pandemic, we definitely shrunk in size our board. So mm-hmm. our ability to organize our capacity to do like all the things we want to do is unfortunately pretty limited. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't do things like put on camp again. And the hope is that by next year, we'll have a bigger board, more people to be organizing in the name of chords. Right. Um, and hopefully that means we'll be at more prides because you know like when you want to support your kids queer identity but you don't understand them yet you take them to pride like that is one of the first places you take them if you find out about a camp there where they could get take this energy that's like targeted towards them like that's great um the other plan is to try and do some more um parent directed programming during the year uh maybe like there are a lot of things that like LGBTQ centers are already doing a lot of things that our community without like cords participating is already doing, um, support groups, peer support, um, for youth. All of those things are things that I think cords is hoping to have some more connections to and hoping to, you know, give those resources to parents, um, during the year, um, we'd be able to kind of, connect more with others who also care about queer youth. Sure. And so, so partnerships that you mentioned partnerships. um, And then of course, if, if people want to support cords directly, I mean, I'm like I said, the cords.org Q U O R D S Mm -hmm. Q not you Q O R D S.org. 
slash to donate. Erase that, people. Hit to, yeah. Hit, yes. Okay. So people can donate mm -hmm. if you want partnerships with this. It just sounds like such great, such great work. Um, there are also going to be two links for following cords in, on Facebook and also on Instagram. Um, is there is there any what uh, how else can we help how how else can the community jump into the you know the community at large jump into this and, and pitch in um i mean for cords if you are interested in volunteering with us volunteer applications have closed but um there is potential for us to reopen those in the future mm -hmm. so i would keep up to date with us um on instagram which is cords k, k oh my gosh q o r d s <laughs> right underscore camp c-a-m-p cords camp um and you should be able to follow us on instagram um for any updates um we might be reopening volunteer applications just depending on um how many we get from this round too yeah well thank you so much for this work yeah. krista it's truly amazing oh, one more thing alternatively yeah. if you know any queer parents with queer kids or or even just kids who there you questioning go. or straight we welcome queer spawn is what we call it um <laughs> <laughs> and uh if if you know any parents who have a queer kid who is 12 to 17 let them know about our camp and that applications will be opening in april 1st that's awesome that's awesome how can people reach out to you if they want to learn more about krista how do they learn how do they reach out to you you can definitely reach me and follow me at, on Instagram at mix.singasong, which is M-X period S-I-N-G-A-S-O-N-G. -S 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 I love that. That's yeah. nice. My That's last cute. name's Song. So it actually yeah. comes from my uh, teaching days when I was miss.singasong. But then I lost access to that Instagram, so I rebranded. <laughs> actually, I like this better. Yeah, right? me too. <laughs> Which I meant to ask you right at the beginning and totally did you've so you, you have the slash in your name so c-r-y uh c-r-y-s slash t-a i've got to mm -hmm. visualize it what's with what how how did you how did you put that together so my name is krista um and when i was in organizing circles i was also going by chris as a okay. form of anonymity in some ways because sometimes organizing isn't always, isn't always the safest um but yeah. since then it's kind of stuck as a, a secondary name for me because my mother also when she's calling for me yelling for me will also go chris so it's not like unfamiliar to me um so i go by chris or krista um in even Cantonese speaking circles where my family is involved, I also go by Tata. So it's not like um, it's an unfamiliar separation to me. Yeah. But yeah, either <laughs> <I> is fine. <laughs> I took that I took that guess, but I love I like the origin stories too. So <laughs> it's fun. Mm-hmm. All right. Well we're we've gone on and you know, we're out of time now. So um <laughs> So I will certainly, I want to thank uh, our audience. I want to thank you, Krista. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, thank you so much for having me. Of course. No, this has been a great conversation. I know it took us a little bit to get connected, <laughs> and I'm glad that that, uh, that we did. It's great. Yes. You're doing amazing work. Thank so, you. Same to you, honestly. You're doing amazing work, oh, too. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I like to I like to brush past that. Sorry. <laughs> I should be more more great more gracious. Thank you so much, Krista. I appreciate mm -hmm. your your compliment there, your praise. So it's hard to accept I am amethyst. I understand. It's hard oh, totally. to accept compliments. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it totally is. I'm always I'm always, you know. I love to diminish it because that's, you know, how I was pretty much how I ended up being raised is, you know. Mm -hmm. I had to I had to diminish myself as much as possible. Before this turns into a therapy session though I'll, I'll cut that <laughs> cut that short <laughs> and just say i am amethyst to herrick i'm here with krista song we were talking about chords and also just uh how music and community plays a, a part in who we are and who we become and how we can become it sure i don't know Love that. i'm gonna let it go yeah, yeah. it's close enough <laughs> thank you so much uh krista 